All right. Welcome, welcome, welcome to you and welcome to you. Listen, I'm so excited. Um, we have an amazing, amazing uh, presentation for you today. Um, uh, so in the words of the great Sid Odara, I would like to give a very fine welcome and thank you to you, <laughs> Stephen. Uh, so welcome and thank you so much and thank you for joining me. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. Awesome, awesome. And then, so just in, I had the honor and privilege to um, just be honored by uh, Dr. Charles Clincy to say, hey, you know, I'll join to share some of my personal experiences on the Jubilee Show. So this is just like, I'm so overjoyed. So welcome, Dr. Clincy. You are an icon. I love you so much. Words cannot convey how much I appreciate your countless and your untiring work in the field of gospel music. Thank you, Eric. You're welcome. So listen, uh, let's see. Here. All right, so when it comes to gospel, um, gospel music, gospel music, it really connects with the inner man and it identifies with one's life adversities and their triumphs. So in, in other words, it's like it's a therapeutic conversation with oneself. Uh, so today we well, pause to take a perspective of so we pause to take a respectable journey back to February 1963, uh, oh, when, of course, in the city of Chicago, uh, where your dad created this indelible imprint in gospel music and helped to bridge uh, unity among humanity. Uh, so we definitely, again, have this uh, wonderful uh, honor to uh, have you. So I want to get started by asking you, Brother Steve, Listen. So you, your dad is right before you. You're in the you're in a conversation with him. How do you end this conversation with your dad? Well, what you mean about Jubilee Showcase? Yes, about oh. well, about what he's done, all of his. Oh, about what he? Oh my yes. gosh, boy, that boy, you you you're coming. You you start off with an easy one. I see. No, uh, <laughs> I mean you know. I, what well, what's interesting, I you know, it's funny you say that because I wish my father was such a um, uh, a knowledgeable historian and a political organizer that I would love to be able to talk with him and actually have a conversation with him about what's going on today. But if I had a you know have a conversation with him, Spring. really, I'm getting to know him through. Um, I'm really have been getting to know him from all of the interviews that I've been conducting. And so um, I would say that, you know, as Reverend Jesse Jackson said, when I interviewed him is that um, you are really the conduit for a lot of the, you know, for this incredible American music, musical and cultural art form to be expressed on television in a way that otherwise wouldn't have been available. Absolutely. You know, I like the way you uh, expounded on that. Uh, I like your perspective mixed with, you know, uh, a lot of other uh, influences for or people's feelings or emotions. So that was a great mixture of an answer. So I want to start here. So in your own words, okay, give me the history and your perspective and what you've learned throughout the years of Jubilee Showcase. Uh, me? Yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, gosh. I've, I mean, you know, there's so much I've learned. I've been working on a documentary about Jubilee Showcase um, for years. I've interviewed Reverend Jesse Jackson, Carol Mosley Braun, um, uh, Congressman Danny Davis. I've interviewed gospel greats such as Mavis Staples, and Albertina Walker, Andre Crouch, um, and Willie Rogers of the Soulsters. And I've really learned that, you know, uh, acceptance and, and crossing boundaries is really possible. It really, really is. Um, if you're, if you're true and genuine, all things are possible. And my father really lived that. I mean, he really, really did that. Um, he, he didn't just talk the talk. He really walked the walk and, mm -hmm. and, um, that's a real refreshing thing to see right now it kind of like as i got older it kind of reaffirmed as i was speaking to these people about my father 
and they were telling me one, you know, of course I'm biased. I'm, I'm his son. I, I think he's great, you know, but <laughs> when I heard from them in a very unfiltered way, time and time again, they were, they were offering information that I wasn't even asking about, you know, how much he did for them and how, how respectful that he presented them on the shows and um, a whole host of other things that he did. Um, such as put them in the union of AFTRA, American Federation of Television and Radio Artists, automatically um, in a time when uh, people are, were being taken advantage of. And, and the show got started in the 60s. So, you know, Chicago was way more segregated than it is now, even though it's not the most unified city in the world for sure, but it was even way more in intensely divided and, you know, he crossed social and racial boundaries um, on a regular basis. He just did not care about his reputation in the conventional sense at, at all. He was just going to speak his truth. And I think a lot of that, what I've really learned is that I found out when he was um, on the day of his funeral, I was handed something that he spoke in front of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee in 1949 speaking out against the North Atlantic Treaty and how we were cozying up to fascists after World War II, such as Franco. And he, I found out that he had a wife and child killed in World War II, which I didn't know. And so I realized that, you know, when you've experienced that type of loss, I think all bets are off and you're just going to be who you are mm -hmm. and let the chips fall where they may. And those are some of the things. I'm only scratching the surface, but, you know, I could go on all day, but that's some of the main things that I've learned. Wow. So let me ask you this. Well, um, when, when was it that you began to get involved in the oh. GBC showcase oh. or did you ever? Well, um, that's a really great question. Cause I, I didn't, you know, I, I started working in um, television and film production. I started as an editor and then a, a producer and um when my father got ill um, in the late 90s, I started, you know, looking after him. And and then all of a sudden people would, um, you know, call and ask for, you know, to license clips out from the archive for various um, documentaries. And so I remember when my mother called me and said that uh, Nightline um, had called the ABC News uh, uh, show they called and and so I just she didn't really know about licensing and I did so I stepped in and I I took care of that situation and then I just kind of managed the collection from there and next thing you know I'm making sure the collection is protected and then I'm making sure that we license it out properly and my wife was was always very supportive so she allowed she actually took all of the typewritten catalog catalogization of the archive and she put it in a digital document so now we can actually allow people to do research with it and so uh, i've been involved with it um for years and then i got the opportunity in 2013 to produce a, a special on pbs um that ran all over the country um commemorating the 50th is that the one that's on the dvd now um well no uh, this is a an hour-long special Okay. And the DVD has excerpts like little small documentary features of specific artists, which is great. Um, but the PBS special was uh, hosted by Clifton Davis and um, and it has some documentary elements in it, but it's mainly full performances from the likes of the caravans, um, the staple singers. I mean, it, it goes on. And, yeah, that's that's is that's what a picture. This is what yep, this is. Yep, that's okay. Clifton Davis. Okay, okay. Yeah, and he okay. was incredible, and he knew a lot of the artists, so he's a legend. And um, I mean, you know, I you know, I I just it's all a blessing. I mean, I my my whole mission is to just deal with it as responsibly as possible. Wow. So um, there's I want to bathe in this. Uh, portion about the union. Uh, I got a chance to uh, interview uh, Dr. Patricia Dunlap. She was one of the first percussionists for uh, Cosmo, uh, Dr. Charles G. Hayes, which uh, Dr. Clancy, who we have on the line here, he started with them when they were Universal Kingdom. 
So he was there with them in 1966 when Cynthia Price was singing, How Did You Feel When You Come Out the Wilderness, Michelle Brown, Herbert Williams, and all that. But however, the first time that she went to the show, she she was really sad because she couldn't play because she wasn't in the union. And she mm. told me that she told me that your she she was really hurt. Mm. She told me that your that your dad uh sold into her life and, and, and was able to get her those credentials so that oh, she really? the next time yeah. she was happy. So oh, the first great. time she said she was playing a tamarind and she was so hurt. So um I'm 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 av well not advocating but I'm being a medium for her and telling you thank you so that you could tell oh. your dad thank you in spirit. Oh yeah yeah <laughs> well you know that that's kind of just I mean, I've heard this time and time and time again. Jesse Dixon told me, you know, it was, you know, I used to ask your father for advice on, you know, when I got to go tour with Paul Simon and, you know, and it goes on and on about how he really, you know, it, it's interesting because I've always been very joyful about empowering those around me. And I can see where I, I mean, my mother was like this too, but I, he was very, very much like that. So he wow. really kind of was grounded in what was important in life. Well, listen, I got to ask you this. Now, of course, we have the footage. The footage is at the Harold Washington Library, mm -hmm. which, the, I mean, I could talk on and on about, you know, how sure. I encountered that and just how sure. it changed my life. I'm literally working on a book right now, and the premise or the storyline of the book talks about me going to the Harold Washington Library with oh. Professor Willie James McFadder and watching himself years later and how the tears began to flow and how I stuck my chest out when we was at the reference counter. I'm here to wow. see the Jubilee Showcase. He's on there. <laughs> so, I mean, it goes on and on. So I want to ask you mm. this question. Mm. How, were, how was the tapes uh, reserved? Like, um, did he always own the masters? Uh, was there a part of the TV company? What did he have to get the, like, how was the masters able well, to be? He, uh, he was, uh, they call him like the last of the Mohicans, meaning he was one of the very few and one of the last owner operators of a television show. Okay. Because okay. really when they pitched it to WLS TV channel seven and ABC uh, in Chicago, they didn't think it was going to be popular at all. They just kind of gave them, they just needed to fill a slot at seven in the morning on Sunday. Yeah, we'll give it to this guy. And next thing you know, it grew in popularity. Well, he had already made a deal that he owned it. So yeah, he owned the masters. And um, before he passed, um, uh, left them to me. And I just happened to know how to preserve and care for footage because uh, the beginning part of my career, I was a professional editor. So, you know, we have to be meticulous with understanding footage. And now as a producer, I've made sure that everything is uh, backed up. Everything is digitized. Everything is backed up off site. And so now say for instance, like Mavis Staples, um, there was a documentary made about her um, for HBO. So they needed footage, you know, they come and talk to me and then I can send them clips very quickly and we have an edit studio in house. So it was like, you know, when stars align and certain things come into focus, it seems obvious that, you know, certain spirits are acting in a way that is really moving things along in the proper direction. And this was definitely one of those situations. Absolutely. Listen, I'm just you. Just, you just don't understand. I'm such having a a wonderful time because, um, like you are blood with someone that literally, you know, I'm an offspring, uh, spiritually offspring of your father and of his legacy because many people in my in my family was touched by his legacy. So this is just mm. like surreal for me. And mm. like I always do this, any interview that I do, I really mean this from the bottom of my heart. I wanna tell you, thank you so much for preserving. Thank you mm. for the sweat, the tears that we may not even see for you keeping your, your father's legacy afloat. And a lot of mm. times these two words are neglected. So I wanna tell you, thank you from the oh. bottom of my heart well, but right uh, before yeah i before, appreciate that i mean i appreciate that and i just want to be clear it's it's a responsibility not just to pr protect what you know what my father's done but it's like a huge 
really critical, important part of, of culture. Yes. And, and, and so it's a responsibility to all of the artists that were on there that were incredible. All of the people that benefit from the music, including myself. I mean, the music is incredible. Nice. And it's, um, it's, it's, it's a really, in, in, um, you know, critical component of the African American experience in this culture, Absolutely. in this, in this country. And, you know, a lot of people don't realize that it's actually the foundation of a lot of the music that we hear today. But, you know, that's a whole nother conversation. Oh, absolutely. So listen, um, I'm going to go to Dr. Clancy really fast. Uh, we're going to sure. talk a little bit about uh, some sets there on the Jubilee Showcase. But keep in mind, I'm a, I want to know two experiences that you had with your dad that you may have never shared. I want this to be the first place that you share in reference to the Jubilee Showcase and his activist work, okay? Uh, so sure. keep that in mind. Sure, so Dr. Sure. Clancy, Dr. Sure. Clancy, listen, listen, can you hear me? Whew, I, 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 you good. I got tired. Do you understand? Well, first and foremost, there, I'm not the type of person that give formal introductions because I believe that your life, your work, it really speaks for itself. You know, and just to say, Dr. Clancy, there's so much power and so much significance in just those words alone for me to have to say, oh, he did this, he did, he did that. Your, 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 your work speaks for itself. So let's let's go to the Jubilee Showcase. Right. But it's such an honor to see you. God, it's Thank just you, an honor. Let me bathe in there, right? <laughs> okay. All right, so look, Thank you. you're welcome. So September 28, 1968, you were on the set with Sarah Jordan Powell. You have the voices of melody. They did um, uh, more love to thee. You remember that song? Wow! Yes, okay. very much so. <laughs> and then so Sarah uh, Jordan Powell, she did "I Find No Fault." Then you had uh, Irvin Miller, which which is that's a guy. Or Irvin a Miller, right? That's Irvin, a guy or a woman? That's a guy. No, Irvin is a guy. Yes. Okay. He just, so he's okay. He just, so he's he just passed. You said? Yeah, about, about oh, four or five years ago. Yeah. Oh, wow, wow, wow. So he's saying, uh, it's me, oh, Lord. And then, of course, everybody with the choir and Sarah Jordan Powell did, Lord uh, is my shepherd. Listen, May 17th. Did, now, these, it didn't air on these dates. This is the date that <laughs> it was recorded. So May 17, 1964, on set, uh, again, with Sarah Jordan Powell. Uh, uh, Nothing changed my love for Jesus. Uh, Jerry Bratton. Do, who is Jerry Bratton? You remember very, that? very much so. Very fine Chicago singer, acted with the um, Church of the God in Christ, and it was like a mentor to me. And uh, he was very highly idolized. He was with very lot of a price, oh, ducking okay. there as okay. uh, a member of Church of the God Church of God in Christ, and then oh, later wow. faith Church of the God in Christ. Very, very popular, very prominent. Uh, Singer in Chicago. Wow, and it looks like he's saying, and James. okay, and James, it looks like he James Lennox, James Lennox was uh, they were very close friends. Oh very, wow, very, wow, very, yeah. Okay, and it looks like he sung um, 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 Reverend Charles Walker's "Heartaches" that particular day. Exactly. Do you remember that? Okay, okay, right, exactly. <laughs> All right, so listen, we're gonna move up. So June 28, eighth, nineteen seventy five. Please explain this to me. You got a chance to actually play for John McNeil and his group, Witness for Christ. Tell me, how was that experience? Fantastic. Uh, they were highly respected. It was the Robertsonians, and the director was actually Joe Robertson, not John McNeil. John McNeil okay. was one of the three uh, people, Joe Robertson, the founder, being one of them. And okay. uh, they were highly respected. In Chicago as a top notch group. In fact, Bob Mays from Christ University Temple followed in Joe Robinson's footsteps, and John Mandel was with that group. So Bob Mays used, uh, uh, had involved a lot of those people at his church, Christ University Temple, back wow. at that time. Wow. But, so on this same taping in 1975, you got the honor and Privilege to play for the living legend herself, Dolores Washington. Uh, we oh, yeah. spoke yesterday. Yeah. You, uh, you told me that you think she had on a blue dress, right? 
Yes. <laughs> I think it was blue. I'm not sure, but it seems like I remember her in blue. Okay. For some reason. <laughs> So tell me how that experience was, because she now I think that she's a very unsung individual in gospel music. Oh, Her voice Lord. was superior. She was yes. unique. She was yes. unique and very, uh, very uh, progressive. And uh, I remember her very well. I don't think that she and I have had much contact, but we everybody knew Dolores Washington. I think she was with the Caravans, and I believe James Herndon. Yes, played. she did a couple. Mm -hmm. She did about yeah. she did about three albums with James. It was Dolores and James. Okay, okay. Yeah. They well, did, and they did very, it on Savoy. She was a very prominent part of of that time with Jubilee Showcase. Oh yeah, so I do oh, remember. Yeah. I, I do remember that very well. She was just wow. a wonderful figure. People, Chicago loves still love. They still love Dolores Washington. Wow, wow. Okay, moving moving along. So November twenty second, nineteen seventy five. See this. I mean, look how how you were just <laughs> on this show. So you got November the 29th, nineteen seventy five. Wow. November the twenty second, wow. nineteen seventy five. You were on there with George Mays. Oh yeah, George was up uh, was my assistant director for the Voice of the Monday. Even after he sang, uh, began his own group, the Voice of the Praise. So George mm -hmm. was a major part part of our success, as well as, as a very uh, strong leader in his own right with Voices of Praise and with the choir of uh, Christ Tabernacle, Milton Brunson. Wow, Reverend Milton wow. Brunson. So George, was, George, who's living now in Memphis, Tennessee, was very, very, very uh, inspirational in a lot of ways. He was a good speaker, good director, everybody wanted to direct like George Mays at that time. And wow. uh, he just made, he made for our success with the voice of the body, wow. especially as an assistant director. So unfortunately, I like to say unfortunately, because I want to just keep on talking about your, your, your Y catalog here at the Julie Showcase, but I want to end on this note, man, May 8th, 1966. Mm -mm -mm. You, Universal uh, Kingdom of Christ, the Harold Barely oh, singers, oh, yes. <laughs> Herbert Williams song, How I Got Over, Cynthia Price, How Did You Feel When You Came Out of the Wilderness, uh, and Michelle Brown, uh, He's Always By My Side. Please walk us through that tape. Those were the days. Uh, it was nothing like, nothing like working with Michelle or Herbert and Cynthia. They were the top notch singers of Cosmopolitan at that time. And uh, Herbert passed away. In fact, Herbert and Cynthia passed away. Uh, Michelle is left. And uh, that was just, those were the days with Cosmopolitan at Sunday night, 11 o'clock, with uh, the broadcasts. And uh, those songs were the favorites of many people. How I Got Over was a top notch piece. Uh, He's Always By My Side was another one. How did you do it across the world? And this all goes with three trend setters for cosmopolitan. Take, so take us through, take us through, take us, take us through that, um, through that take. Can you hear me? With, uh, with, with those three singers. Take, take me through that taping. Like, do you remember? Take, take me through a typical taping. They were, they were done on Sunday mornings too, right? Or no? No, no, no. We never no? did take. They played on Sunday mornings, okay. 8 o'clock. Okay. O'clock and, and then 9 o'clock later. But we taped, it seems to me we taped on a Saturday. Stephen might know this as an how, how that's, how, 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 do you? Can you tell us, Steve? Um, yeah, well, they always, they usually uh, recorded the shows a week or two ahead, or if not earlier in the week at some point. But yeah, they, right. they in the catalog, you see the record date, um and the the broadcast date okay so nice. they're always different yeah it's never on a sunday never right. okay okay yeah, gotcha. yeah 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 okay so take us through a typical taping where preferably this particular taping you are walking the studio where's the studio at do you have to go up some stairs uh where's the chairs printed at i mean like what's going where's yeah, we, the instruments we, we, take us the studio was channel 7 190 State Street. I think it was yep. 190 North State. Yeah. Oh, 
Is that right? right? Guys stayed in Lake. <laughs> yeah, stayed in Lake. Wow. And uh, okay. we, would, we would always have about an hour. It was, Sid was always extremely punctual. He was a man of uh, strict, uh, strict discipline. And so he required that we be like an hour or an hour and a half earlier than the show. Then we would go through the show, actually, actually go through the show uh, as it's going to be. Uh, there was never any improvising or last minute or any out of control emotion. Everything was very strict and very, uh, very to the point. We would go through the entire show, but like an half an hour, an hour. I mean, the show in its entirety. Then we would go through the actual, actual taping. And we had to wear a certain color shirts because at that time, white did not go well on TV. We had to wear, if it was a white shirt, we had to wear a, a yellow or some light color, but not ever white. And I think mm -hmm. that might have changed after we got into uh, color. But black and white was for about two years or three years the 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 uh, color we used black and white and then around I think sixty six it went to uh, color mm. okay. and uh, seats were even the well the actually the audience wasn't there for the rehearsal we would mm. go through the entire rehearsal and then they would walk in the audience about mm. fifteen to twenty minutes before the show started. And then we proceeded with the show uh, nonstop for for the rest of that. So we were there about three hours. For the, for, so rest of the time. Quick, now, was were there tickets given out? Like, how how could you attend the show? Uh, it you, were tickets. You and Steve? To, our, different choirs and artists had so many tickets for friends, and so I see that, Sedley, Cedric. Fortunately, every. Uh, so had full audiences with chairs and all. So we knew we had an audience always mm -hmm. uh, for the show, but that's how the ticket, that's how the audience uh, was, was, uh, was, that's how we brought the audience in through giving out tickets for the audience oh. members. Okay, so that, that, that brings me to this. Now, your dad, not only was he just uh, this extraordinary uh, TV host or just this actress, he was very uh, involved in the the gospel music community as it relates to emceeing programs and things of that sort. Now, do you have any, can you share some experiences of him emceeing and, or you can chime in, Dr. Clancy, of, of him actually emceeing a program? Like, how was it? Was he energetic? Was he kind of straightforward? Like, yeah. Sid, Sid was everywhere. Okay. Every gospel program, we would see Sid. And he wasn't just sitting there. He was always called upon or expected to play a major role, uh, whether it's the emceeing, or whether it was like remarks, he was just involved and acknowledged and respected uh, in every gospel program. He knew the gospel people, he knew the gospel community, he knew the artists by name, he knew every, he knew the details of each artist and the backgrounds. You would think that he was a gospel singer because he knew so much <laughs> about the gospel community. Uh, he was everywhere and, and we just, in fact, the last time I saw Steve, I said, was at uh, my program uh, around in the 90s, I think, maybe early 90s, 91. He came to Martin Temple and gave me an award. I still have it. Gave me a trophy to my shock and <laughs> surprise for my contributions and, and God's music, what he saw and thought that I had contributed. I was just amazed that he would even be there, not to mention give him some kind of award. Mm. So that was in the early 90s. That was my last time seeing I was actually mm. away. I was in Chicago then. I came back to do the concert and then went back to um, either, either Texas or Indiana, wherever I was at that time. Wow. 
Mm -hmm. Well, so uh, let me let me uh, deviate off just for one second because it, it would be, you know, a crying out loud shame if we did not capitalize on this moment by you being the last accompanist for Mahalia Jackson. You have the book out, the Handbook of Gospel Music. Tell me how it was uh, playing for the queen, the, the uh, should I say, the <laughs> first queen, the the original <laughs> queen of gospel. I mean, Mahalia Jackson is more famous now than she's ever been in her life. When you when you hear the word gospel music or the term gospel music, Mahalia Jackson comes to mind. And that, don't, that doesn't matter what age bracket that is. So tell me how that personal experience uh, playing for Mahalia Jackson and then also being involved in your other things throughout the city. Well, actually with Mahalia Jackson, I think I was probably too young to really know or appreciate who I was working with. Uh, as she began to decline in her later years, after she passed, of course, I realized where I had been. A fantastic experience, unbelievable. She was just really uh, all and more than the people have said about her lately. Uh, as, as time comes and goes, I have a greater and greater appreciation of my time with her. Uh, I wish I had been older to, to fully appreciate that experience, but I learned so much from her. She was a woman of integrity. Uh, she was uh, active in all areas, politically, uh, uh, in the arts, of course. She gave scholarships to many people. She um, was a real, real pivotal uh, Contributor, contributor during the time of uh, the early civil rights movement and even during prior to that time when we really were struggling as black people. She took in homeless people. She fed uh, hungry people and, and homeless people. She was just a real humanitarian. Uh, uh, it goes on and on and on as far as her contributions go. Uh, just my experience was I learned so much because I was classically trained uh, as a musician, but I learned about, about my music by being with her, by uh, just being open and learning. I was young enough to listen, to learn enough to, young enough to be open to learning about uh, what my music meant. And as I've gotten older, I have a greater appreciation for that time, which was... Uh, which was shortly after the civil rights began. Civil rights was started about 55 or 56. So this, and I began working with her in 67, 68. So she, there was still this great affinity towards Martin Luther King, who, who, who was killed in 60, uh, 60, uh, 68, uh, 68, I believe, 68, yeah. Along with Robert Kennedy, Jones, but, but John Kennedy had been killed in 63. So then Malcolm X in 65. So there was this real emphasis on Black is beautiful, emphasis on our heritage, Black heritage. And I, it was at a time when I learned a lot about my own self, about me. Right. And uh, so this, 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 was, this was a tremendous time uh, that I benefited from. And I was wow. so glad I lived through that time to appreciate now what it meant, what Mahia Jackson meant, and how she, uh, played a major part in my mm -hmm. own development. Wow. So let's get back to the Jubilee Showcase. Dr. Clancy, words cannot convey, uh, even fathom, even the, the wildest um, way to just express my gratitude for you sharing that from you. You know, a lot of people can say something but you know someone that actually was there speaks violence so that means that you, you of course you experienced these acts of kindness and this wonderful character that Mahalia Jackson was. All right Steve let's go back so did you think of those experiences? You, now they have to be good they have to be good and well, no, no, experiences well, well just you, and you no 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 with you and your dad but before we go there I forgot sure. that where where did the chant where did Jubilee Jubilee where did that come from I don't know, actually. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised if it came from the North Fleets, but I'm not sure. I never, I did. never knew that. But it there, did. It did. It did. Yes. The, yeah. I well, just, that doesn't surprise me. It, okay. It, it brings it back. North Fleet started that, and then we all 
Fed. Okay. Fed By the way, um, we developed it. Um, Reverend Clancy, uh, I, I was wondering, uh, did, did did my father know Mahalia Jackson at all? Do you happen to remember that? Because I, no one I yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. Oh, they did. Yes, yeah, yeah. Oh, they do her very well. I, I, There's I, a I, picture with her. There's a picture with your dad and Mahalia. Yeah, oh, really? Talk, oh, I would yeah. love to get a copy of that. I, I mean, I I wish she had been on the show. Was there any talk of that? Do you well, know? He, he, he tried. Yes, we we talked about it a lot. He tried to get her uh, involved and get her to participate, but she was always away. She was yeah, that's what I figured. And then she passed away. I heard. Yeah, but she passed at seventy one. I was with her at sixty seven. Oh, so I was with Sid. I was with Sid from sixty three to sixty four through sixty six. Okay. The next year I was with Bahia. So oh wow. So she was, they just could I reach her. They could I get to her because she was gone too much. Plus yep. she was way way. She was in Europe. Probably more yes. than the state. Yeah, so, uh, it's interesting it, how the Europeans will appreciate culture that we follow is them. not we, not as appreciated in the United States. Well, like we jazz do is a good, it, but only after the Europeans do it first. <laughs> right, 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 right. Jazz, gospel, yeah. same thing. Interesting. Born, born in the states, but appreciated in Europe uh -huh. and other few countries, and then the states pick it up. Well, I would imagine they probably saw, like you know, they were somewhat of like mind because I know my father was close with Dr. King and uh, Reverend yes, Jesse Jackson, and so yeah. they're probably of like minds in that way. So that doesn't surprise me. Oh, that thank you for letting me know. I didn't know that. <laughs> and yeah. as we as we uh, talk about the Northfleet brothers. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, one of them, they owned either a meat shop or a barbershop. One of those, I think it was a barbershop. One of the Northfield brothers and the one that either owned the store or the barbershop, uh, he set out a couple of tapings and the legendary Walter Howard from Chicago actually filled in and was a part of the Northfleet brothers uh, for, for a short tenure. So that was uh, great. I got a chance to get that information. And I was like, really, really, really? So tell me this, how was the Northfleet brothers able to just uh, uh, be able to be a part of this from its conception all the way to its end, really? How, how did that even come? How, like, how, how was that, you know, possible? I think that's, that's uh, uh, maybe Miss Clancy can... Uh... <laughs> Know that I, I I don't really know. I know that they were a staple. I mean, I, you know, I was a really young kid. I was, at the time. I was and that. and you know, I I was I was born in '68, so um, oh, so uh, okay. you know, oh, okay. <laughs> so I will defer to the wisdom on the call here. I might actually, have I might have a couple of years on you, Steve. Okay, <laughs> but actually. Uh, Jubilee Showcase was that started about '63. Yes, and it, yes, exactly. And then my, my last time on Jubilee Showcase would have been '66 or '67. It was '75. Well, I came back because I was with Bahia. But wow. actually, are you sure? Yeah, because my... you was on the show. Yeah, you was on the show where it, um, it was in '75. You did a couple '75. That was the last year I think you did because I don't think you did. No, actually '76 because you. You play for the institutional um, institutional Church of God in Christ radio choir uh, from New York. Who's yeah, on I, that do, I remember in October the the second, nineteen sixty six. Nineteen seventy six. Did not know that was a year. See, my yeah. had passed away. So I must have. Okay. must have got me. To, Sid must have happy to come back to do that with them. Yeah. You was a house musician. <laughs> I was a house musician. Yeah, you was yeah. a house musician. There was, I mean, the the, the level right. of talent. It was incredible. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm including yourself. I mean, the level of talent on Jubilee Showcase I've heard from everybody who was involved is was just uh, excellent. I mean, Jesse Dixon was somewhat of a house I, organist, and he's a he classically was, he trained. Was. He's an incredible arranger and musician, a musical Jesse artist. Was and a, Jesse was the other part. He was a major part of Jubilee Showcase. But actually, yes. Sid, Sid went through the black community, and found the best singers, the best. Musicians and the best choirs and groups and had them involved in uh, in Jubilee Showcase. So he knew everybody. He he made, was, he made it a point to know people and to bring them in. So yeah. yes, it was yeah. true. 
It was interesting what you were saying about him as a producer, because I've heard from everybody. He was like right on the money. He wanted, he ran a very, yeah. very tight ship. And it's funny it? because yeah. when I, when I produce things, I feel my father coming out of me. Cause all I can see what <laughs> is what's not, what's not perfect. That's all I care about is, what's, it's, you know, he's not, it. you know, he really wants it right. Because I think, you know, what everybody said is that he was ultimately very respectful of the music and the people so. that were, that were uh, creating it. And I'll that say was, that he was yeah. genuine. Uh, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say that he's, he was really generous too, because there was an appreciation program that was thrown at uh, what was it, Vernon, uh, the Pastor Eddie Wyatt, Wyatt, his church. What, what's yeah, the name Vernon of his church? Park. Yeah, Vernon, Vernon Park. Park. They, Park. He actually gave those individuals that were being honored that night the copies of their performances on the Jubilee mm. Showcase. Mm. All of this is on YouTube. Mm. Oh, Did wow. you ever get a chance to see that, Steve? Uh, no, I mean we're we're posting. We're currently. I'm starting to. We the Jubilee Showcase YouTube channel is up. And we've posted about 25 performances, just songs, full performances. And, you know, I'm slowly but surely posting more and more so more people can experience this. Gotcha. Yeah, so look, I, I, I want to say this, and I want to do a, do a very transparent moment. To me, why Jubilee Showcase is so essential is, is that gospel music, to me is a, a history book of the lives that sings it. Um, mm -hmm. What it does is as you look at every different decade in the time dispensations, the things or the lyrics or the sounds that they pre presented, it displayed what they went through, their triumphs and everything's mm -hmm. like that. So your dad, he came in a very pivot point where the civil uh, uh, civil rights movement was going on, and and he stood for uh, equality, and, and and he gave like for somebody like me, I'm only 36 years old, but to be mm -hmm. able to go and visually put an image to these performers and these performances, you know, is very profound. So. G Jubilee Showcase is so much more than just a show. It's so much mm -hmm. more than just an uh, art form or culture. I mean, it, it, it reaches it reaches to areas within a soul that, you know, no human instrument can go. Uh, it reaches to the spirit where, you know, it's intangible. Like, we can't reach the spirit. Your dad was prophetic, and he did an amazing job. And I want you to know that you being his son, listen, man. You, the apple don't fall too far from the tree. You are blessed to be here. There's a reason why you're here. And I'm telling you, the work that you're doing is proving that you're definitely your father's son. Because it's amazing. Because there's a lot of people that could care less what their parents do, especially when they go on and they move on in their lives. So mm -hmm. you doing what you're doing, I want you to really understand that it's so much more than just keeping your father's legacy alive. You're, you're ministering. You're ministering to the present. You're ministering to the future. So I just wanted to throw that in there. <laughs> well, I, I appreciate yeah. that. I mean, I feel like when I'm, when, I'm, when I'm going through the archive, I feel like the music is ministering to me, to be perfectly frank. I mean, I get a tremendous amount of, like uh, Albertina Walker said, it's like food for the hungry, um, a spiritual nourishment. And, um, you know, it's... I mean, there's a responsibility that comes with preserving history. And you're right, it was at a pivotal moment. And, you know, Reverend Jackson put it the best that the Jubilee Showcase and my father, they, he acted as a conduit to allow this incredible music to reach more people and heighten the awareness. Um, and, you know, he was, he was a really, I mean, he never spoke too much he always introduced the, the artist um, very respectfully. And that's the thing about Jubilee Showcase is that it presented gospel music as an art form. Yes. Um, and, and yes, they were definitely, there was a sense of having church, no doubt about it. You can feel it coming through the TV, no, no question. But the bottom line is he was presenting it in a way that it needed to be, res um, it should have been presented in, a, in the re most of respectful ways. And all of the artists knew that 
it, mm-hmm. from what I can, you know, from what I can see, I heard it again yes, yeah. and again yeah. and again. And, For um, sure. you know, he, I mean, and you know, when you're, when, you know, I, I'm a musician, so I know that if I'm in a situation where I'm playing music and I'm respected and people and, and the situation is respecting the musicians and the music, well, I'm going to play better. I'm going to, I'm going to sing better. I'm going to do all that stuff better. And so when you feel respected and that there's a sense of love in, in, in the air, well, um, they're going to um, bring their A game. And that's another thing. Everybody in Jubilee Showcase was the best of the best just about. I mean, right. most of the right. notable artists of gospel music of the time were on the show, which was incredible. And, and you know what? You, you just brought up a good thing. See, the thing is, is okay, like, even with the Fist, Ju- uh, Fist uh, 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 Jubilee Singers, uh, mm. I believe his name was George White. So what he did was, and uh, Dr. Clancy does a very colorful and very wonderful job in his book. He describes and Bob, must give props to one of my mentors, Bob Maravich. Uh, mm-hmm. He does a very colorful job showing how George White, what he did was he created or not created, but he kind of he structuralized spiritual music. You know, at first it was just mm-hmm. like it was no structure. So mm-hmm. he gave this structural form to these spirituals mm-hmm. and they were able to travel throughout, you know, the country and overseas abroad. And mm-hmm. they, they presented this music with a structure. Your dad got to music, you know, when it first started, it was really no structure to it mm. in a sort of sense, to be quite frank. Mm. Your dad, what he did was he presented them. He gave a little history about the songs that they sung, the right, ended, right, how right, long right. they. So what he did was he began to kind of give a formal, or he 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 gave class to something that was just pretty much what because gospel music wasn't created to be an art form. You know what I mean? Spirituals yeah. wasn't created to be an art form, and, was it, just, and it wasn't accepted in the church for many years. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So I mean, yeah, and he, I mean, he cre- he gave this platform which um, was long overdue, you know? Mm -hmm. So like Reverend Jackson was saying, you know, Jubilee Showcase provided this outlet for all of this incredible amount of talent that didn't have an outlet like that before. Then all of a sudden you get people like Albertino Walker singing Amazing Grace for the first time on television as their first solo appearance. I mean, that's, that's a timeless, timeless performance. And wow. you've got the Soulsters singing and the Staple singers and Andre Crouch. And so, you know, you've got this parade of this of of talent that now all of a sudden people can it's in their homes and they can see these people perform. And it just it just busted down the doors and opened up a whole new era for the music to be seen and heard. Right, right. Okay, so look, I want to ask you this right before I sure. go. Uh, sure, uh, sure. So go ahead and share some some experiences that we probably would never know if it wouldn't have came from you. Well, As it I relates mean, to Jubilee Showcase, like you, maybe a dad and son talk, you know, son, you know, um, we, we really did do, do a show for almost 20 something years, like some, some, some type of. Well, you know, there was there there was one that I can think of you know, right off the top of my head that I really haven't shared with many people, but I was, you know, taking care of my father before he passed. And, um, and I was describing, you know, like I've been conducting these interviews and I'm getting to know about him. And then I said, you know, I asked, I was interviewing Albertina Walker and she said, she started talking about my father's relationship to the music and civil rights and how she, bold he stood for people such as Harold Washington and how bold he was with his convictions. And she said, he couldn't have done what he done. He did without the power of the Holy ghost. And I, and I said, really? And she said, yeah, he was, he was definitely a born again Christian. And I said, I did not know that, you know, because he's Jewish. And so, uh, so I told, I told my father that, and he just kind of paused and looked up at me and smiled and said, She's just paying me a compliment. And I just (laughs) laughed. I mean, but, you know, I think there is more to that story. I think my, honestly, I think looking back on it, I think my father really, um, he experienced a lot of comfort from the community and from the music um, because they accepted him as he was. 
and he accepted them as they were. And it was a very powerful um, partnership. Wow. So that's, that's one little moment that I don't really share with many people. Mm -hmm. Wow. So, um, so tell me, okay, I know you have the DVD and everything like that, but Give me some some of the various other avenues that you're doing or, oh, or you yeah. are venturing down, you know, sure, as it sure, relates sure. to your own legacy. Oh, uh, or well, as with I, your own legacy and Jubilee Showcase. Hey, I mean, it, well, you know, I'm hesitant to say uh, put my, me in that, but I'm I'm just being a conduit, so <laughs> and a privilege to do so. But right now, we're um, you know, the we have a YouTube channel on uh, Jubilee Showcase YouTube channel. You just search Jubilee Showcase and we'll have more and more performances up there. We've recently released a 36 song compilation on every major streaming service and that's being distributed through Time Life and Warner Music Group. It's and that now? started in late January. That's out now. So that's on Spotify, Amazon um, Music. It's on any YouTube, where, wherever you get me Apple Music, just type in Jubilee Showcase and it's a 36 song compilation from audio only just from Jubilee showcase. And we've actually remastered the audio. So it's excellent. And I've, I curated oh, this collection. And it so is. help me Jesus. You got the caravan. Yeah. The yeah. Northly brothers, yeah, uh, staple single. Oh, wow. Okay. Oh yeah. It's incredible. And you know, I'm also, um, uh, we do have a DVD for sale, um, on Amazon. Um, that you just type in Jubilee Showcase and you'll find the DVD. We have only about, you know, a thousand, fifteen hundred left. And that's left over from the PBS special that I produced in 2013 that ran all over the country until 2014. And, and the project that I'm most um, really excited about right now is I've been developing a documentary around the show for years. And so I'll probably be starting editing in the next few months, but I've interviewed Reverend Jesse Jackson, Mavis Staples, Carol Mosley Braun, Danny Davis, um, Andre Crouch, Albertina Walker, Jesse Dixon, and it goes on and on. And I just, I want to get a couple more high profile interviews, like from Jennifer Hudson, popular artists who are, um, you know, really uh, influenced by gospel music. John Legend, for instance, as well as a great example, who can really like speak to the younger generation and let them know how much of an influence gospel music, particularly the artists on Jubilee Showcase have on the musical landscape to this day. And that's really, really important. And another thing that your audience members should know about is I produce a podcast called Rhythm of Life, a Rhythm of Life. There's another Rhythm of Life, but look for the Rhythm of Life um, uh, where I'm one of the hosts and Bob Hercules, a, a very prolific and experienced uh, documentary filmmaker um, is also the host and the recent um, episode there's you know we interview people from film culture and um, a variety of topics but um, two of the six episodes so far one is with Mavis Staples and she's talking about her career and Jubilee Showcase and Reverend Jackson is the le latest episode it's episode six and he talks all about Jubilee Showcase and my father and we we shut that right at op Operation Push so I repurposed this interview that will be for the documentary, but I repurposed it for the audio space for an audio podcast. And it's extreme. And there's a lot of great gospel music in there. A lot of great gospel. So if you're a fan of gospel and want to know more about the history of Jubilee Showcase and uh, my father, listen to that episode on Rhythm of Life podcast. Wow. Well, listen, like, um, I don't want to, you know, um, I don't want to uh, just keep this uh, as I don't want to keep this just going on and on and on and on and on. So I'm a pause here. Uh, but I must say that it's incredible that, you know, sometimes like we have epiphanies and we do certain things and then we really understand the total meaning, meaning or the purpose for them years later. So I know that mm. there's a significant reason for this interview. Uh, mm. for this whole presentation, but only time will tell mm -hmm. uh, just the impact or the imprint that it will have. And mm -hmm. I'm almost certain if I had this epiphany that this right here will serve as inspiration to the future. So I'm honored to have been able to be a part of this with you. <laughs> I appreciate it. I thank you for having me. And then one thing I 
Uh, forgot to mention is that when it um, when we were doing some PR for the audio compilation release, we um, I was interviewed by Rolling Stone magazine, which was incredible because Rolling Stone is one of the most prolific music magazines publications in the United States. And so the 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 reporter that that interviewed me really understood the significance of the show. And it was so refreshing because when you talk to a lot of people that are not within gospel, they don't understand the significance. So talking to you is a breath of fresh air, to be honest oh, with oh, you. I appreciate and that. so but but you know a lot of people don't, but he did. And so um for any of your listeners, if they wanna read that article, they can just Google Jubilee Showcase and Rolling Stone and it, you know, that really it's I really want to get it like people outside into the greater landscape to really understand the significance of this groundbreaking show. So thank you so much for helping wow, that. Wow. You're so welcome, man. Um, I'm, I got to end on this note, like I always say, love, oh, oh, oh uh, I must acknowledge, uh, I didn't know that this was going to be the day that they had Rashawn's, um, the guy that was murdered in um, oh gosh Atlanta. I didn't know it was going to okay. be his funeral, but I pay homage and um, I do uh, stop yes. in, in silence to his um, to his uh, to his life. So I just want to throw that out there. But remember, like I always say, love on someone and change a life. Okay, until whenever we'll see you. Bye. Thank you so Amen. much. Amen. Now I got to find out how to Take get care. out of here. <laughs> Bye. Thank you, Steve. You're welcome, and thank you, Eric. <laughs> Welcome. Bye-bye.